Welcome to Never Again Is Now, a podcast about anti-Semitism. I am Evelyn Marcus, and in addition to being a psychologist, I'm featured in the documentary about anti-Semitism, Never Again Is Now. I am a Dutch Jew and the daughter of Holocaust survivors. In 2006, I immigrated to the United States because of the rising anti-Semitism in Europe. I'm Phyllis Zimbler Miller, the founder of the free nonfiction Holocaust theater project, TheEdgeOfTheWedge.com. I grew up in a small town in the Midwest, always as the only Jewish student in my classes. But my grandparents had come from Latvia and Russia at the turn of the last century. So it was an American Jewish community that had very little connection to the Holocaust. And yet in 1970, only 25 years after the end of World War II, my U.S. Army officer husband and I were stationed in Munich, Germany. The experience changed our lives forever. Evelyn? Attorney Kenneth Marcus is the founder and chairman of the Louis Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law, a national organization begun in 2011 to fight anti-Semitism on college campuses in America with law and public policy. He has served as staff director of the United States Commission on Civil Rights and as the head of the US Department of Education Office for Civil Rights. The American Jewish newspaper, The Forward, once listed Kenneth at the top 50 of American Jews who made a significant impact on the Jewish story in that year. Among many other accomplishments, Kenneth Marcus, Kenneth Marcus is the author of the two books, The Definition of Antisemitism and Jewish Identity and Civil Rights in America. Kenneth, welcome to our show. We're honored and excited to have you on. Yes, and I get to ask the first question. Much of your career has been dedicated to decreasing anti-Semitism, especially on university campuses. Could you please tell us what motivates you personally to engage in this difficult battle? Um, Evelyn and, and Phyllis, it's uh, good to be with you both. Um, I mean, frankly, given what's going on in the world today, I don't know how any human being might not be uh, motivated to deal with these issues, especially any Jewish American. A number of years ago, I was involved in a situation where I was a child and uh, kids from a nearby uh, community uh, approached my street and started throwing uh, stones at me. and. Uh, yelling that I needed to go back to my Jew town. Um, I, I, I told this story a couple of years ago and the Wall Street Journal uh, explained that this was a reason why I was concerned to address anti-Semitism uh, in my professional career, uh, but they had actually uh, failed to tell the rest of the story in which I explained that this was one of the reasons that I was concerned about discrimination against all people and why I entered uh, the field of civil rights to protect uh, African-Americans, Hispanic women, disabled and other people against various forms of, uh, of bias, uh, having no thought at the time uh, that we would be seeing the sort of resurgence of anti-Semitism that we've actually seen over the course of the last several several years. Based on my um, family history uh, as, uh, as a Jew, I've always been concerned about uh, bias, discrimination, and prejudice affecting uh, anyone, and that's why I entered civil rights. It's rather uh, been to my horror uh, that I have found that we need to address uh, anti-Semitism in our time, because the problem that for so many years uh, had been in decline is now, sadly, uh, and uh, horrifically roaring back uh, around the globe, including in the United States. And that's why we, Evelyn and I started this podcast, because we couldn't just sit still and not say anything because of this dramatic increase. So could you briefly describe for us what anti-Semitism looks like on American campuses, where it comes from and what the impact is? 
Yeah, I mean, um, it, it really is sad to be uh, talking about anti-Semitism on American uh, college campuses. This is certainly something that growing up I heard about as being a part of our history, but something that I saw relatively little of when I myself was a, a student. We're now seeing several different kinds of uh, anti-Semitism. We are seeing uh, a revival of older and right-wing uh, and European forms of anti-Semitism on college campuses. So for instance, in the Louis de Brandeis Center's recent survey of AEPI and AEFI uh, students, we found that many of them were being called uh, stingy and greedy uh, and, and conspir conspiratorial. Um, the sorts of um, the sorts of uh, tropes associated more with uh, old school, old fashioned anti-Semitism than with the new anti-Semitism, uh, and of course we see uh, neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups entering uh, the campus either in physical space or in cyberspace with, for instance, Zoom bombing uh, during the COVID uh, period. This is. Uh, something we're seeing increasingly and it's alarming, but the much greater, much more frequent problem on campuses and the one that more frequently begins within the campus itself rather than being imported from outside the campus uh, is more of um, a left wing uh, and um, Arab world uh, influenced uh, anti-Semitism that is intermingled with anti-Zionism. We are seeing um, old fashioned anti-Semitism in a new disguise. Uh, where uh, agitation against the state of Israel is a vehicle by which anti-Jewish stereotypes are coming back. That has been most pronounced over the last decade within the so-called BDS movement. That is to say the movement to uh, boycott, um, and divest from and sanction the state of Israel. But what we've seen more recently, say in the last couple of years, is that it's not just an effort to boycott and divest from Israel, but rather we are seeing a much more targeted set of attacks on Jewish students and Jewish institutions, efforts to marginalize, stigmatize, and exclude Jewish students, especially from positions in leadership. So for instance, we have had clients, um, Jewish students in student government uh, who have faced impeachment efforts uh, on both coasts. Uh, by those who think that Jewish students uh, should not be permitted uh, to have uh, positions of influence in student government because they would be supposedly biased or, or inappropriate. So we're seeing uh, a range of different forms of, of anti-Semitism and we're seeing it increase and we're seeing it more targeted uh, and more focused on individual students uh, than we have in the past. And uh, kind of that, that um, shift in the past <clears throat> decades to um, from from the the, the old anti-semitism which comes from biases and and prejudices and stereotypes uh, and that's is still there but the, but the the there is uh, an incredible growth um, of the anti-zionist kind of anti-semitism now targeted as as you um, tell us or to individual students even uh, on campus that they cannot um, uh, get a position um, in some commission or so because they um, as Jews are um, pr probably Zionist and that is not acceptable anymore um, on campus in, in many instances. Is there there is an Arab influence, you say, there is a influence from the left on that. Is there a plan actually, or is this just growing organically uh, and spontaneously? I, I would say it's both. There are certainly organizations um, that have developed uh, national plans, sometimes even international plans to uh, marginalized the state of Israel, which have included uh, efforts to change the climate on college campuses to the detriment of American Jewish college students. We're seeing that a lot, uh, but it does uh, tend to grow organically, as you put it, as well. Uh, and it grows even on COVID-closed campuses, where the degree of uh, physical interaction is lower, uh, but where uh, as uh, classes have gone online, anti-Semitism has gone online as well. And that's had uh, several impacts. Um, for one thing, it's meant that 
there's been a change in the timing or calendar of the problem. There was a, there was a time when we could anticipate that anti-Israel agitation would increase during the spring and would have its worst manifestations uh, during uh, March, April, and the beginning of May. And the reason for that is that some of the anti-Israel extremist organizations needed time to organize their plans, needed time to uh, convince other students to join them. And frankly, good weather was better for some of their uh, protest uh, uh, activities. And so we found, generally speaking, that while there were problems throughout the entire year, that the bulk of the bad actors came out uh, in the spring. What we're finding now is a real change within the last year. Um, in particular, uh, there has been continued harassment of Jewish students during school holidays, uh, even during summer breaks, when uh, in the past we saw a much uh, lessening of it, there, there was sort of a continued uh, agitation. And what that's meant is that this fall, um, students came back um, in the first place, uh, I think uh, emotions for everyone are somewhat at edge uh, in the COVID, the COVID uh, period. Uh, but, um, and, and I think that this whole country has been more ideologically polarized and, and intense. Uh, but this fall, we've seen uh, that sort of polarization, that sort of intensity. And we've seen students who are uh, engaging sometimes for better, but often for worse uh, during the fall months um, as if it were the worst time in the spring. So we're seeing a greater intensity uh, that doesn't have the same limitations and that doesn't even seem to take a break. Do you think the, the, the Gaza crisis in May had an influence on that? Yes, there's no question about that. Now, we took a survey I mentioned of um, fraternity and sorority uh, students uh, last semester that was immediately prior to uh, Gaza. And we found um, disturbing levels of anti-Semitism uh, last semester before Gaza. But there's no question that problems exploded with Gaza. Uh, we saw it certainly on news reports from the city streets, whether in New York and Los Angeles and Southern Florida and elsewhere. Uh, but we saw on college campus a volume of incidents uh, during the Gaza conflict that was greater than we've ever seen before. Um, in prior years, if that had happened as late in the spring as it did, the impact would have been much less uh, because it was shortly before students were leaving uh, a campus. So this, if this had been in 2018 or 2019 even, uh, I think that the impact on the campus would have been reduced. But because students were online anyhow, Right. Uh, the Gaza impact had a much stronger and more continuing impact that led through the summer and into the fall. Um, okay, let me let me please ask you a question about the BDS movement. Um, the BDS movement, BDS stands for Boycott, Divest and Sanction uh, Israel. Um, this movement seeks to, uh, to let Israel make concessions to the Palestinians. Um, do you consider this movement anti to be anti-Semitic? It is certainly an anti-Semitic movement. That doesn't mean that every single person who gets swept up in it has anti-Semitic intent, but it does mean that the movement as a whole is anti-Semitic in its nature. I've been making this argument for a number of years, and I would say that a decade ago when I first published uh, this uh, argument, it was described by uh, critic Paul Berman as a ferocious argument. <laughs> now, nowadays in the year 2021, I think that there is a much more widespread uh, acknowledgement uh, of what a BDS uh, really is. Uh, the um, uh, former Secretary of Education uh, with whom I worked, uh, Betsy DeVos, uh, used to ask people if they knew what uh, BDS stands for. Uh, she would wait for an answer and say, that's right, BDS stands for anti-Semitism. Uh, and, <laughs> that's good. And I, and, and I think it does. Um, and I think it stands for anti-Semitism in perhaps four different respects. First, um, I think that um, there's a fairly strong evidence that many of the leaders and participants in the BDS movement have been consciously, intentionally uh, anti-Jewish. 
Uh, that's not everyone. I don't know if it's a majority, but there are some who are clearly using the BDS movement as a vehicle uh, to harm Jews because they are anti-Jewish. Second, uh, some people may participate in the BDS movement thinking that they are involved in a human rights cause, but in fact, the BDS provides for them an opportunity to indulge uh, the implicit bias uh, that they have against Jews, which is to say uh, they are not consciously uh, or deliberately anti-Semitic, uh, but they do have a, a bias uh, that is not uh, consciously accessible to them. And there is uh, uh, some uh, research um, showing that um, uh, anti-Israel uh, um, views uh, do have a correlation. And then there's some studies showing that some of it is, is unconscious. Third, uh, even for those who have neither a conscious nor unconscious form of anti-Semitism, uh, by participating in the BDS movement, they are advancing uh, anti-Semitic tropes and memes and, and terms. That is to say, they are participating in a process by which anti-Semitic uh, language and stereotypes, et cetera, are transmuted throughout a society. And fourth, uh, whether they mean to or not, those who are involved in BDS are participating in what has become the main uh, effort uh, to marginalize, uh, stigmatize, and exclude the Jewish state. Uh, it is the single biggest attack on the Jewish people that we're facing within uh, the public sphere. And so to participate in it, whether consciously, unconsciously, or otherwise anti-Semitic, is to participate in advancing an anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic movement. And is there, uh, you mentioned anti-Semitic uh, expressions that are used by the BDS movement. If you look at their acts, is there a certain act or a set of acts that, that count as anti-Semitic? In your view, you, you talked about a lot about intention, but if we look at behavior. Um, so sure, there are different ways in talking about what is behavior, but I would say that the efforts to advance boycotts, to advance divestment, to uh, uh, advance sanctions, those acts are uh, anti-Semitic uh, in, uh, in their nature. Um, I would also observe that the leading definition of anti-Semitism in our time, the so-called working definition of anti-Semitism, now referred to often as IRA uh, for the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's uh, definition of anti-Semitism. That, that definition does look to words, but one of its innovations is that it is not based on any sort of expectation that we can read people's minds or know their intentions. Uh, but it's based on the notion that some of the um, uh, language that we use is, is anti-Semitic in its, in its nature. And that includes uh, language that uh, demonizes, for instance, the, the Jewish people or in, in attempts to uh, delegitimize the Jewish state. Okay. Um, what is the most important law or policy against anti-Semitism on campus uh, that you have been involved in? No question, it's Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is the part of our civil rights law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin in colleges, universities, and other institutions that receive federal funds. I would say that uh, anti-Jewish activity on campus can implicate any number of different uh, laws. And we've certainly been involved at the Brandeis Center in cases involving physical assault uh, and other crimes uh, under uh, state law, uh, violations of student conduct code. We've seen um, anti-Semitic activity involved in suppressing Jewish speech with um, ramifications under the First Amendment of the Constitution. Uh, but the biggest single uh, statute is Title VI, and that is, implicated, for example, uh, at attempts to um, create a hostile environment for Jewish students on college campuses. Title VI is the uh, preeminent tool for addressing hostile environments for Jewish students, and it has been for uh, some years. It was uh, somewhat of a, a shock to me to learn um, some 20 years ago that the federal agency 
that addresses these issues and ensures civil rights for college students, the US Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights or OCR, was not protecting Jewish students um, under the civil rights law. Although in thousands of cases every year was protecting any number of other different groups, racial and ethnic minorities, women, the disabled, uh, older students, um, uh, et, et cetera. And yet Jewish students were not protected under this group. In 2004, I issued the policy under which Title VI was interpreted um, to include protection of Jewish students. And that clarification in 2004 was enormously controversial. There was uh, pushback against the notion that Jews should receive protection against the civil rights law. And I would say there was a battle until at least 2010 uh, to, uh, to make sure that there were these basic protections. Since 2010, when the Obama administration ratified the policy that I had developed half a dozen years before, the biggest challenge in using Title VI has been to define it so that it is applied not only in the old fashioned and uh, neo-Nazi and white supremacist cases, um, but also in those cases that form the bulk of what we're seeing on campus. That is to say those that involve some form of anti-Israelism or anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. That has been an issue that I've had to work on, I would say for the last decade, arguing that OCR and other agencies needed to use the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. The decision to do so is one I made as head of OCR just a couple of years ago, but it was then elevated by the immediate uh, prior uh, White House uh, into an executive order, the executive order on combating anti-Semitism, which directs OCR to use the IRA definition. That is a crucial uh, advance. Fortunately, uh, that uh, executive order is still in place, although in general, the prior administration's executive orders have been archived, but it remains a part of the formal guidance of the US Department of Education and its Office for Civil Rights. My hope is that this uh, new administration, the Biden administration, will apply it and enforce it in the spirit in which it was uh, developed and as forcefully as we did in the past. That's uh, definitely a big step and a big accomplishment um that was made there uh, with the, the new definition for um, anti-Semitism and protecting uh, students on campus against that. Um, which, has, has that measure been effective, you think? I think that that measure has been effective in various uh, respects. It certainly was useful in addressing anti-Semitism cases that came before the department at the end of my tenure as head of OCR. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, just um, a year or so ago. Uh, beyond that, it is critical in educating and changing the climate of, of opinion. There are still some who argue that if something relates to Israel, that it is merely a political dispute. Um, and it is important to emphasize that while there is some criticism of Israel that is simply political argument, uh, like any other sort of uh, political argument, uh, much of what we're seeing on, on campus goes beyond that. And oftentimes anti-Semitism is disguised as anti-Israelism and needs to be treated just like any other form of hate or bias or bigotry. Um, which measures in general have been effective against anti-Semitism on United States campuses? Uh, which ones have not been effective? And which measures would you recommend to add in the future? At the end of the day, legal tools have been unavoidable. Um, I think that what has been least effective but most frequently employed has been what I would call quietism in its various forms. Uh, people who take the position that what's needed is closed door behind the scenes relationship buildings with uh, building with administrators. Uh, they think that if we build a good, quiet relationship, uh, that good things will happen. Now, I, wanna, I don't want to suggest that that never works, nor do I want to suggest that we shouldn't have strong relationships with those who are in power. But it only works if there's leverage. And, and that leverage comes from legal tools. Education is critically important, but on its own, it's not enough. Universities need to know that for anti-Semitism, like for other forms of 
civil rights violation, whether it's sexual harassment or inaccessibility for the disabled or uh, racial uh, hostility, uh, that they need to address these issues not um, as a political matter uh, and not just because it's the good thing to do, uh, but because the law requires it and because they will face consequences if they do not. Very important to face consequences. So what can our listeners do individually to help fight anti-Semitism on campus? Every one of your listeners can do something. And certainly if they are uh, US citizens uh, in the United States, uh, they have a voice, they have elected officials to whom they can be in touch. Uh, if they are concerned about whether the federal government is properly enforcing uh, the civil rights laws, including uh, protecting Jewish students from campus anti-Semitism, they can urge their members of Congress to uh, take action and to uh, conduct oversight over the appropriate uh, agencies. Uh, if your listeners are alumni, alumni of uh, uh, colleges, universities, or public uh, schools, um, see what's going on and make, make their voices heard. Uh, this is true if they are donors uh, to their institutions or not. Um, they certainly can have an influence. And when something is happening at their institutions, uh, make sure that the administration understands that this is something that they are concerned about uh, and that they, want, uh, that they want action. It's also more possible than ever before to be uh, vocal uh, through, uh, through blogs, uh, through comments on newspaper articles, uh, I mean, how often do we see an article involving issues like this and the uh, online comment section in major newspapers is uh, dominated by uh, anti-Israel activists and those who are anti-Semitic themselves? Uh, use your, use your, uh, your, your writing, uh, uh, write uh, in these comments to these, uh, uh, to these newspapers or write op-eds for your uh, local uh, papers, um, many of which have uh, space dedicated for local views uh, by people in the in the community. Volunteer to uh, groups, especially if you have uh, skills that can be uh, useful. Provide financial support if that's something that you are uh, able to do. Uh, there are any number of different ways in which people can be active and influential. So before I give you a chance for last words, I want to take this opportunity to talk about something because I'm 20 years older than you. And I think you went to college campus in the golden age, because when I started at Michigan State in the fall of 1966, I was uh, faced anti-Semitism. So I thought immediately I'll join a Jewish sorority, which was AE5 eventually. And we went through Rush. And here's the thing, Rush was in the uh, winter term of 67. We had to go to every single sorority house and yet we knew that we would never be asked to join most of them, you know, all those fancy ones, Kappa 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 Gamma, I can still sing the song. So we still had to go, even though they wouldn't accept Jews. And that quarter or the next quarter, the uh, official Michigan State administration invited the head of the American Neo-Nazi Party to speak. So that's my husband to be wrote an editorial. We, we organized a campaign. We went to uh, the, um, his speech wearing, I don't forget what we wore. And that was the first time I saw how you could take absolutely true statements and string them together to make absolute falsehoods. So I'm not surprised that fraternity and sorority students today, again, in this rise of anti-Semitism, are facing what I faced then. So you went in the golden age. Anyway, any last thoughts? Uh, well, yes, I mean, thank you for that. But um, it may surprise you after everything I've said so far to hear me say that I believe that this is also a continuing golden age for college students, Jewish college students, uh, although one that has uh, dangers and limitations. It is a golden age in which uh, there are now more positive opportunities than uh, ever before. Yes, it is true that we are seeing a surge of anti-Semitism uh, that is uh, worse than uh, when I was in, uh, uh, in school. And uh, yes, it's also true that the trend line is moving dangerously in the wrong direction. On the other hand, 
uh, it is also true that there are all sorts of opportunities for uh, for, for Jewish uh, students. My own college uh, certainly had never had a, a Jewish president at the time uh, that uh, I was there, but now it's had uh, two or three uh, in a row. Um, there are now also more opportunities for uh, Jewish religious worship on campus in many places than, uh, than before. Uh, there are more uh, Jewish studies and Israel studies opportunities. I don't love every single one of them, but I do love the fact that there uh, is so much of it. So it is on the one hand alarming and should be alarming um, that there are so many problems and that they're getting worse. But at the same time, let's not forget uh, that there are many great opportunities. And this is a time uh, when Jewish college students also have uh, opportunities that never existed before. Very well said. Thank you for reminding us. And thank you so much for appearing with us today. We thank our listeners. Please everyone, if you have not yet seen Evelyn in her documentary, Never Again Is Now, do so. You can see it for free at joinneveragainisnow.com. You can learn more about my free Holocaust theater project at thinedgeofthewedge.com. And everyone, as long as you don't put yourself in physical danger, speak up against anti-Semitism and hate whenever you can.